is giving glory for this another moment on this platform. We have been here almost five years. As we forge ahead in the word, we give God thanks for the ministry. We give God thanks for all the destiny workers, all the supporters, the God presenters and teachers, and those that are coming even for the rest of the year 2024. We are grateful and we are giving God thanks for the privilege and the access that we have to feed his people with the word. And so we are grateful this evening and we are saying to you as you joined us, welcome, welcome to this another evening as we forge ahead in the word, coming to you from the Church of God, Sabbath Keeping here in Ottawa, Canada and Montreal. And so we are looking for a very wonderful and interesting month, the month of August, and our teacher and presenter will be introduced to you as soon as possible. Bow your heads with me. Let us invite the presence of God to take over and to rule the atmosphere at this moment. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. Oh, what a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Our God and our Father, through Jesus Christ, we bow ourselves before you this evening. We are grateful for life. We thank you for grace and mercy. Father, we thank you for all your goodness that has been running after us. And Father, we recognize, Lord, that the reason why we are alive, Lord, is to carry out your will. And we pray, Father, that the Holy Spirit will empower us to do so. We thank you for all the saints that gather on this evening from all over the world. We're praying in the name of Jesus Christ, O oh Lord, that as they join on this platform this evening, they will receive a word, they will receive a blessing, encouragement, empowerment, and your name will be glorified. We present our teacher and presenter in your hands this moment. Pastor Don Keith Moore and his family and ministry. We pray, Father, for your covering and your anointing upon this humble servant as he come to teach and to edify your people. Lead, we pray, Father, bless our readers, bless each and every one of our destiny workers. I pray in the name of Jesus that this afternoon as we bow ourselves before you your will will be done as we ask it through jesus christ our lord we pray amen and amen brothers and sisters at this time i'm going to invite sister Faye, and she will be introducing our teacher and presenter at this time Yes, good night, everyone. Um, it is an honor and a privilege to introduce our esteemed presenter for the month of December. It says December here. No, no, the thing I'm reading from really says December. Okay, so sorry about that. Let me do it over. Okay. Yes, it is an honor to introduce our esteemed presenter for the month of August, okay, originally from Jamaica and now residing in the United States, Pastor Dale Keith Moore is a devoted pastor whose ministry consistently emphasizes the importance of keeping Jesus at the forefront of our lives and work. Known for his impactful counseling work, he specializes in premarital group and individual guidance, helping to change lives through his pastoral care. He and his beloved wife, Sister Rhoda Moore, have celebrated over 22 years of marriage and are proud parents to a wonderful teenage son. Please join with me in extending a warm and heartful welcome to Pastor Dalkit Moore as he takes over. 
blessed. Blessed by the name of Jesus. Amen. Are you hearing me, everybody? Yes, sir. All right. Thank you very much, Sister Faye. Pastor Carl Quarry, greetings in the name of Jesus to you and all the members. Thank you again for the invite. Um, it, it has been a rough one getting here, but but we're here. Um, Brother Jeffrey, it's good to see you again. It has been a while, and so I'm happy to be here with you. We're going to be speaking on a very serious matter as it relates to addiction. I'm thanking you for the prayer and for those songs. I was here earlier listening to them, and they are very inspiring. Greetings to one and all. As you come, let's get into the word this evening as we, sorry, as we allow the Lord to lead our lives and to bless us abundantly as we go forward. The format of this, as I understand it, as I go ahead and present, you have the opportunity to um, participate, to ask your questions, to um, feel free just to chime in and to ask and to make your points. It would also be good if we go through much of the presentation, but depending on the leading of the Lord, where we go from here is really up to the Lord. And so again, welcome one and all, happy to have you. And we do hope that we'll all learn as we go forward. So I'm going to be inviting at this time our readers to come forward as we get into our introduction. Okay, praise the Lord. Amen. There are several topics that the church may frown upon because there is a belief that we are either immune or covered from them. No need for us to discuss them because those things are for people outside the church. These taboo topics are sometimes seen as an offense to the sound doctrine, an unnecessary evil that will poison the minds of good Christians. The church is known for casting everything that is considered strange into the same trash basket of demonic. This is certainly not a modern phenomenon, but because we can see this even among Jesus' disciple. After he did the unthinkable walking on the water. According to Matthew 14, 22 through 33, Jesus, who had it all planned out, how that he would reveal himself as deity, made the disciples get into a boat and go on ahead of him to the other side, came walking on the water. His close friends and followers seeing this became terrified and cried out, it's a ghost. Jesus on another occasion had to drive home the point after healing the blind man. Neither had this man sinned nor his parents but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. As we embarked on educating and growing our minds, we want to turn our focus to the matter of addiction. This is a growing problem in the world because there is not a family, class, or race that is untouched by this disease. A classification made by the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual Disorder, DSM-5, in 1987, addiction is considered one of the hardest battles to fight because it is driven by a force that is not only misunderstood, but often mistreated. It is a continued and compulsive consumption of a substance or behavior 
gambling, gaming, sex despite its harm to self and others. From the young 13 year old boy hooked on cocaine to a 78 year old grandma stuck in a world of kleptomania. Addiction should be something that we should all pay attention to. The aim of these presentations is not to offer medical advice and or treatment of any kind. Therefore, whatever treatment, therapy or program you or anyone you know are involved in, this should not serve as a substitute in any way for those. This presentation is solely for educational purposes with the aim of starting and dialogue to uncover some of the hidden issues with our silently suffering from. It is to deepen our understanding of the pitfalls that are before us and to open our eyes to the dangers. It is my prayer that we take the advice given by the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 5.15. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. The goal is to have an open discussion on the topic identify our own weaknesses and make a concerted effort to correct them if they are identified. The topics that will form the basis of our discussions are addiction defined, the impact of addiction on the individual, family, and society, fighting addiction and Surviving Addiction by Pastor Moore, written by Pastor Moore. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I appreciate the reading quite well. Um, quickly, anything anybody wants us to go back to, any questions that you may have, any concerns, anything quickly from the introduction, let us find out if there's anything on your mind that you want to talk about that jumps out at you from the introduction any paragraph that you want me to turn to and by the way i'm not able to see who is raising their hand past the quarry so you may have to help me out with that and let me see what's going on i will help out with that brother jeffrey's oh, in charge thank you brother oh, okay. jeffrey Thank you very much, sir. So, you, you all right with me interrupting you when the hand comes up? Then, no, no, no. I mean, I'm good. Wherever okay. you know, whatever you want to do, yeah, okay. that's good with me. All right. So, if if anyone would like to raise a point, ask a question, um, yes, I do. Go ahead, please. Uh, I believe that this topic. Greetings again, everyone. I believe mm -hmm. that this topic is so hidden that it's painful in the sense that as Christians, we tend to hide away from making this awareness within the body of Christ. Mm. And also within the um, Caribbean culture, it also is a taboo um, that is not, I grew up, not knowing that this was a problem. It seemed like a regular thing, especially with alcohol drinking. It was like mm -hmm. a regular, it seemed like a norm. Um, and as growing up, we do see that it is uh, um, abnormal and that alcohol is an addiction as well as um, substance, you know, drugs, hard drugs. So I'm very appreciative of um, this topic. It's swinging a different way to to touch our our hearts to see that we are holistic we're not separated our 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 way of life style does play a role in our relationship with Christ and and bringing this to the forefront um i think is extremely great 
I really appreciate you saying that and the way you put it is quite clear. I, for one, I have family members who have suffered from addiction and I'm sure many others can say the same. I currently work at a center, um, cannot disclose any information, of course, because of legal issues, but of course, and I've seen a lot of stuff and this is what drove me to and Pastor Quarry asked me to say, hey, let's let's do this. Because I mean, sometimes, sometimes we get so deep into the theology of church so that we miss the, the life that we should be living and that we're living outside the walls of church. And so it's very important that we look at these. Anybody else? All right, if not, I want us to go to the scripture because there are some, there's a scripture reading that I want us to go to. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1 to 21, I'm going to ask the reader to come forward again and read for us. As, and I want us to pay particular attention to the advice that the Apostle Paul was given here. You can go ahead. Praise the Lord. Amen. Ephesians 5, 1. Be ye therefore followers of God as their children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be ounce once named among you as becometh saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them, for ye were sometimes darkness, but now ye are light in the, word, in the Lord, Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord and Amen. have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Hallelujah. Rather, reprove them, yes, for it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. Mm. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Mm. Wherefore he saith, awake thou that sleepest and arise, hallelujah, from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Mm. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine, Mm. Herein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Hallelujah. Mm. Speak to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Amen. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. 21. Submitting yourselves one to another 
in the fear of the Lord. Praise God. Thank you. Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 What a passage. The same inspiration that it was read with just now. That is what I got when I looked at it and I've been reading it over and over and over and over. I think I can recite it now, looking at what Paul wrote in terms of how we should live. Now, this passage is not just about securing your salvation. It is also about maintaining good life good life. In other words, there are things in the passage that will, it's not so much will get you into the kingdom if you don't do it, if you do it rather. It is about maintaining this kind of a solid moral standing in your surrounding where idle jesting and certain talk that you have in your mouth and certain things that we may say will come across as being offensive to God and to other people. And it corrupts your soul and we must be very careful. And Paul is pulling us out of these things because all of these I consider are gateway to a lifestyle that is not good. And a number of persons who are hooked on several things are finding themselves walking through these gates, walking through the gates of being drunk with wine because they think that nothing is wrong with taking a sip. Um, and they can quote scriptures on these too. You know? People love to use scriptures to back up their wrongdoing. And they quote scriptures and they, they talk about what the Bible says. And so they continue to drink. And what they don't understand is that it now becomes a medical situation that they're dealing with. And so we're going to be looking at it. I'm very excited to get into, into it at this time. Quickly, one more. Anybody want to say anything about the passage that was just read before we get into the presentation? Can we move on, brothers? Yes, you can. That's it. All right. All right. So we're going to move on. All right. So we're looking at addiction. And addiction is broad, but we're going to try to narrow it down a little bit. So the it is to continue the continued and compulsive consumption of a substance or a behavior, gambling, gaming sex despite its harm to self and others. So simply what this is saying is that the person continue to consume. It's a compulsive, which means therefore that they really can't stop themselves. And um, they continue to consume. So whether it is sniffing, smoking, drinking, needle, um, whatever form it is, and substance or behavior, watching, listening, whatever the behavior is, gaming, gambling, sex, whatever it is, although it is harmful to themselves and others, they continue to do it. So that's that's really the, the basic definition of addiction. The continued and compulsive consumption of a substance or behavior Gambling, gaming, sex, despite its harm to self and others. There's a Latin word for addiction that I found while working at this center, and it is called addictus. And it is assigned or surrendered, and it means a slave to something. It is a slave to something, the word addictus, coming from addiction. And which simply mean that once you are addicted to a substance or a behavior, you become a slave to that, which means that the thing or the, the, the substance has become your master and it tells you when to do it. So for example, somebody can be in, the, in, the, in, a, in a queue or a line waiting on something and they have a problem 
um, with smoking or drinking or sex, and they will get out of that line to go to the bathroom to do whatever they are doing. They can't wait. And I'm going to be talking about the neurological issues that they face as we go further. Some researchers believe that chemical addiction is not simply a direct effect of drug on the brain, but rather a pathological relationship that a person has with the drug. And so sometimes it is not the direct effect of the drug on the brain. In other words, the effect that it has on the brain is not as strong as the relationship that that person has with the drug or alcohol, for example. So somebody who drinks may not may not simply drink because um, they, they're having a, an issue with the brain and the brain is telling them to drink. No, it's just a relationship. Once they smell it, they have to get it. Acti addictive disorders, addiction is not easily understood. It represents a pathological relationship between an individual and a substance or a process. And so what this simply means is that it, it, it has to do with how, what relationship this person has with it, because there are some people who feel that they can't do without certain things. And I'm going to be saying a little bit more about that. I'm going to be looking at addiction and also psychological substance um, dependence. A maladaptive problematic relationship that continues despite increasingly negative consequences. And this is very important, you know. Persons know the consequences. They know that it is going to wreck their family. They're gonna lose their jobs. They may even get hurt. Um, you know, lose their license, whatever consequence may be, penal um, um, consequences, but they still do it because it is a maladaptive behavior. Maladaptive here simply means that it is not a normal behavior. It is abnormal. And so they continue to do that. The psychological dependence now represents a physical um, reaction within the body in which the body begins to crave or require a substance to maintain a certain level of homo, um, homostatic, which is a state of balance in the body that needs to function properly. So if the body, if you wake up in the morning and you are used to drinking coffee, for example, if you don't get your coffee, you're gonna have headache. Um, for some persons, they have to have a cup of tea or whatever they may need to have. So the body is not going to function properly until that. Now, what this is saying is that that's a psychological dependence. It is not a real dependence. It is not something that is real. That is why certain person will say, I can't function without my coffee. That is how they feel about it, and they keep feeding that. And I'm going to be talking about what exactly they are feeding. They are feeding into that notion that they can't do without it, but that's a psychological um, dependence that they're having, not a real addiction, all right? And so that psychological dependence will now take them into what is called addiction, which we'll be talking about some more, all right? Let me pause here. Any questions, anything that you want to ask or add? Yes, Pastor Moore. Um, Go ahead. Is, are cigarettes as well? Definitely, and and those those are coming up. Those slides are coming up, right? So cigarettes, and because the nicotine in cigarette is very very strong and high, and I'm going to be saying a little bit more about those. All right. All right. So addictive versus substance use disorder because the American Psychological Association, the DSM-5, and it, it, is, it is a book that we use to, to diagnose um, and diagnose conditions. So when we talk about persons have a certain condition and they are diagnosed with this, it is the 
um, the DSM-5 that we now use. We are now at DSM-5. We're coming from DSM-2, DSM, all the way up, and now we're at DSM-5. So what it says is that this, it, they really don't use the term addiction um, in diagnostic capacity. It uses the term substance use disorder. So you're going to hear me use those sometimes interchangeably because I'm still getting used to that. Um, so we call it SUD and SUD sometimes. Um, and I'm going to give you the purpose why they don't. Look at this scenario right here. This is a man who met in an accident and he had a back injury and he's prescribed oxycodone. This is opioid. An opioid is an illegal drug, but it is used in medication for pain. The body develops psychological, um, sorry, physiological dependence on the drug, which means that the body feels like it cannot do without it. So when you pull something from the body, it's going to wonder, why did you do that? Because I need it. If he misses his medication, say, for example, this man who has this back problem, he goes throughout the day, he rushed out of the house and didn't remember to take his medication. He might experience symptoms of opioid withdrawal, the same kind of feeling that the person who is addicted to opioid is going to have that feeling. And it comes with certain withdrawal. When we talk about withdrawal, we're talking about issues pulling away from a substance such as stomach upset, chills, et cetera, is going to have all of those mirroring the person who is addicted. But that does not mean that he's addicted, though, to the substance. It's only that his body has developed a physiological dependence on the medication. And, of course, depending on the dosage, it will, within a few days, the person will, will not meet this criteria of soda. So the point I'm making here is that the DSM does not use the word addiction because when you talk about addiction, it is what we described earlier, that the person is using these substances and, and, and behaviors despite the dangers that are there. For this man who met in an accident, he's not doing that. It simply means that there's a pain and he's trying to the doctor is treating the pain and the pain, the area of pain is wondering what is happening? Why is it that I'm not getting this substance anymore? And so it is now crying out. Is that clear? Any, everybody clear on that? Any question on that point? All right. So let's move on. So let's look at the history of addiction now because... You know, this is where I'm going to take it. Remember, what we're doing tonight is just simply looking at addiction defined. We're just defining addiction because we have a couple more weeks to go in which we're going to be talking about some of the dangers and some of the issues that we have. Um, it is going to be so frightening because there are some of us who will recognize some of the things that we are addicted to and we didn't even recognize that we were addicted to it. So at the end of this, we're going to see some of those things. So it says um, more than more than twenty seven million people ages twelve and twelve and older use some form of illicit. Now, when we talk about illicit drug, we're talking about drug that is not illegal, but they are morally unacceptable. We we'll talk about um, so, for example, you may use a prescription drug in an illicit manner. It is not illegal, but you're using it in an illicit manner. So it says more than 27 million people ages 12 and older use some form of illicit substance in the last 30 years. The largest drugs among these are marijuana and painkillers, which we call pharmacological drugs. So when we talk about pharmacological drugs, we're talking about drugs that are prescribed by doctors. And so what they're saying is that more than 27 million of people since the last 30 years have used some of those. The number would have increased long time ago because the source that I got this from 
um, dated it in 2020. So the numbers would have increased a long time ago. More than 22 million met the criteria for an official substance use diagnosis. In other words, they, are, they can be diagnosed as alcoholic or cocaine user or whatever. 22 million. In addition, 22.5 million people, that is 8.5% of the U.S. population, ages 12 and older, needed treatment for an illicit drug or alcohol problem in 2014. A mere 4.2 million, or 18.5% of those needed treatment, received any substance use treatment. In other words, so half of that, 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 that uh, sorry, 4% of that number, a mere 4.2% or 18 um, point five of those needed treatment receive it. A small percentage of that received the treatment. And part of the problem is that people are not going for treatment. I, I, I did a little study of my own and I recognize that people of color don't like to go for treatment. At, this, at several centers where I check, I realize that most of the persons there are Caucasians and other races and very few black people because we feel that we can fix the problem and also we don't feel like we don't have a problem. Like what was said earlier, especially in the Caribbean, that people think it was normal to just go around and just drink until you're drunk. You drink until you can't stand up anymore. And people say, wow, you can hold your liquor and you're good and, and so on. But then we didn't recognize that we had a problem. But yes, it is a problem. Prohibition law in the United States in the 1920s to 1930s banned the sale of alcohol, believe it or not. Nobody could sell alcohol in the 1920s to 1930s. However, the black market um, consumption, or sales rather, increased consumption by 50% a year later. So when you ban a substance, for example, marijuana is banned in certain country, the use of it is going to be higher. And in countries where, where and, and, and in countries where it is not banned, although the use is high, but the kind of lifestyle is going to be different because then you find that persons will not hide and do it. They're going to come up front and there's going to be rules and laws that govern the use of it. So it's very important to know that. Whenever time a substance is banned, the use of it increases. Um, so also in 1805, German Frederick um, so Turner discovered morphine. Now, morphine is another strong drug. It's one of the earliest drugs that was discovered, which was 10 times more potent than opium. In 1853, Alexander Wood invented the syringe needle, which helps to make taking drug a little bit more easier. And so we find that the use of drug was now being found out how this thing can be done. Heroin was invented to replace morphine. And when we talk about invented, we're not talking about because all of these are coming from plants. And so when we talk about, we're talking about made into drug. And we're talking about pharmacological drug that I mentioned before are coming from prescription drugs. They did it to replace morphine because of its strength, because they are saying, hey, morphine, heroin is stronger than morphine. But guess what happened? Heroin turned out to be two to five times more potent than morphine. Cigarette, and here it is that the question was asked, cigarette rolling machine was created by James Albert Bonsack on September 4th, 1880, and it made over 20,000 cigarettes. And since that, I nobody can count the amount of cigarettes that have been made. There are different brands all over the world. In 2012, opioid addiction killed more Americans than guns and car accidents. So you tell me if this is not a serious problem. It is a serious problem. All right. And so 
let's talk about how this thing work. Why is it that people get addicted? Because we're now defining addiction and see how it actually works within the brain and, and that kind of thing. So we're going to be talking about that. So there are three basic types of um, neurochemical responses. Now, when we talk about neurochemical responses, we're talking about all the chemical process. I see the hand, Sister Marcia. Go ahead, please. Uh, good evening, sir. Good I just evening. wanted, I'm not clear when you say illicit. So I raise my hand because I notice you're moving away from that. Illicit, is it over the counter drug and so like, on whatever, I don't call the name, um, caffeine yeah. and those things you're talking about? Right, right. So let me, let me explain to you. So for example, you got some, you got some prescriptions from your doctor. Those are not illegal drugs. Those are legal drugs. But you can take them in an illicit manner. So for persons, sadly, who take an overdose, okay. which means that they take more than the amount that they should take, it is prescribed. taken in an illicit manner. More than prescribed. More than prescribed. Okay. And also, marijuana, for example, in some areas, it is not illegal, but it can be taken in an illicit manner. So it has to do with how it is taken and the purpose that it is taken for that make it either illicit. But then there are illegal drugs now. So say, for example, Sister Gooden, opioid, heroin, all of these morphine, if a police officer should find this drug on you is going to lock you up because okay. they are illegal drugs. Yes. But the doctors use them and put them into medications, especially for pain and other things which I'll talk about. And so if you take them the way that they are not prescribed, it becomes an illicit drug. Okay, thank you. Right? Yes, I hope that helped. All right. Thank you for your question. All right. So I was talking about the neurochemical um, responses, how it actually works with the brain. So we're going to get into that. This is going to get a little bit technical. So pay close attention right now. Turn off whatever you're doing so that you don't miss it. Pay close attention. I'm not a medical doctor. And so all I did was my little studies and so came up with this. So pay close attention. So there are three types of neurochemical responses. In other words, you have three points in the brain that can pick up certain things when it's happening. And so when something happens, it tells you that this is happen, happening and how you should react to it. One of them is arousal, especially in sexual activity. Now, that is why if a brother see a sister and she's not properly dressed, it does something to his sexual body. It is called arousal. And that is how the brain interprets it. Everybody clear on that? I hope you're clear on that. The other one is satiation, not saturation now, but satiation, which is the state of being satisfied and unable to take more. It's like your stomach is full. You go to dinner and you're having your meal and your brain tells you that it is time to stop eating because you're full. So that is another way in which the brain interpret these from the chemical. The other one is fantasy. And fantasy is an increase in um, preoccupation of a desired object or person. So persons can sit in their living room, in their bedroom, and they can fantasize. They about a situation. They didn't have to see anything in their mind. They can close their eyes and go into this fantasy world. So what these three does is that when someone takes a, sus a substance or they involve in certain lifestyle, what it does is that one of these three start to react and it start to react. So say, for example, you go to a friend and they're having a party and they said, okay, uh, here's a glass of wine and you take some wine. This wine is going to do something to your brain. And one of these is going to react to it. 
So it's either going to increase your sexual drive. It either going to say to you, no, I'm full. I don't want any more. Or it is going to say to you that this is what I want because you're now desiring something else. So this is how the neuro neurochemical responses work in your brain. Once your brain hit with something, once your eyes see something, once your ear hear something. So all of these are windows to your brain. And once it sees, smell, taste, touch, anything, these start to react. And so the brain now start to react to it. Any question before I move on from this? All right, none. So let's talk about the main man now. This is the this is the main person that you hear me talk about right through the presentation until we're done. It's called dopamine, and it is a feel-good hormone. Dopamine lies within the brain, and well, let's talk about it for a little while. Dopamine was identified as a neurotransmitter, neurotransmitter in the human brain. Now, don't be afraid of these big words because the neurotransmitter actually means that it, it is what operates in the brain. It is a chemical that sends certain signal and it operates with it certain way. And I'm going to explain how it operates in the human brain. And it was discovered in 1957 by two scientists working independently, Orville Carson of Sweden and Kathleen Montecu of London. These persons discovered it. It does mean that it wasn't there a long time ago because God made it. So they didn't make it. They just discovered that it is there. And so it is called a pleasure spot. Now, pleasure and pain are co-located in the same region of the brain. In other words, in the same thalamus section of the brain, that's where you have pleasure and you have pain. That's the same section that can make you laugh and the same section can make you cry. It is where those things locate, the same section in the brain. They are in the overlapping brain regions, both work like a balance, like a scale. When, they, when we experience pleasure, dopamine is released and tips towards the pleasure side. So let's look at it. This is a scale. If, if this hand is feeling more pleasure, then it is going to tip a little bit more because more pleasure is going into this. And this side, if it is experiencing pain, it becomes down and dull. And so it's a scale. Now it must be balanced. And sometimes we don't get it balanced. And I'm going to show you how what happened when we don't. Feeding the side of pleasure means it gets weaker and more dependent. So say, for example, you have a child and you, you are doing everything for this child. You feed this child. This child is 18, um, 17, 18. You're feeding this child. The child don't have to make their bed. You do everything for this child. This child is not street smart. So the child is going to become dependent. When you pull away what you're doing from the child, the child suffers pain. Now, when we talk about pain here, we're not only talking about physical pain, we're talking about psychological and emotional pain also. So when persons say that they are addicted, what this simply means is that we keep feeding one side, which is the, which is the pleasure side, and we are ignoring the pain side. And I'm going to say some more on that. And the, the side of the pain gets stronger and more independent. So if you leave this other child, so you have two children and you're taking care of this other one and you're not taking care of the other one, then it simply means that the other one is going to be free to, to run around and to do whatever they want to do. And sometimes when that pain child come back, it is going to be more um, egregious than before. So this is an example. A child is there playing with a video game and you take the video game from the child. The child is going to suffer what we call pain. You hand it back to the child, it increases pleasure. Say, for example, that same child, you give that child a bigger game or a more advanced game or 
you put that child in a room with a large television. What you have done is that you have flooded that child with pleasure. And so it is going to be more difficult for you to pull that child away. That is why I am speaking to my younger parents here. And I'm saying to you guys, stop giving your children um, smartphones. And I'm talking about babies now. Stop giving them smartphones and, and tablets and all of these things to keep them quiet when they are crying. What you're doing is that you are getting your child addicted because you're feeding the pleasure. What you need to do is to let them suffer pain because pain is what is now going to give them the experience in order to deal with the issues. But when you keep feeding the pleasure, what you're doing is that you're pushing them further to addiction. I want to pause right there and have some comments right there because I think that that point is very, very important. You have your children in church, for example. The last time I was at a church, um, a function was going on and about three or four children, they were sitting in front of me and their parents were sitting with them and the children were on their phone playing games and the sermon was going on and all of these things. Now, if you should take these phones from these kids, they are going to suffer pain because they have removed the pleasure. And then, so what that means is that we're now training them to become addic addictive um, persons. Let's have a little discussion on this for a little while. Yes, go ahead. I'm brother. my hand raised. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm very uh, uh, impressed with this lesson, first of all. Uh, it's very, uh, it's needed. Um, a lot of these things we don't know about what you're bringing up right now. A lot of us don't know about this. Um, some of the brethren online, uh, they know uh, uh, how I feel about uh, the cell phones. Uh, my wife is the same way. She, uh, you know, we 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 try to, you know, and I'm not trying to, like, I'll say it like this. So, like, we don't let our kids use their phones in the church. Um, and I've already given permission to anybody in the church, any any of the elders, any of the 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 moms and dads, they see my son, they see my son with a cell phone, they can tell him right away he's in trouble. Mm -hmm. um, because, um, you know, I find a lot of um, parents can't, and I wonder if the, you're going to address this maybe this week or maybe next week or later in the month. Like, what do the parents do in this circumstance? You know, because they're scared to lose their child, right? If they discipline them and they tell them, oh, no, you can't go on your cell phone, they may not go to church no more. You know what I mean? So I'm wondering, um, not to take you off of this, um, because I think this is excellent, but I'm just curious, though, what's your thoughts um, for the parent side for that I, cell phone conversation? Yeah. I, I do think that the best place to start is earlier when the child is younger. But if the child is, 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 is older, mm -hmm. we have to take them through. The, the the science of it and let them understand from a scientific point of view that what i'm trying to to rid you of is for you to become addicted because the thing about it is that we're afraid of pain people are afraid of pain so what we do is that if your head start to hurt we we'll run for the medicine chase and we we'll try to get something for the pain we we'll try to stop it but sometimes the pain is a deeper issue that is going on and we need to address that Persons don't like to see their children cry. They don't like to, 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 to see them look sad. And so what we do is that they give them things not to make them look sad and not to make them cry. Back in my days, that was not the case. You ball, then you get something for ball for. <laughs> right, Pastor Quarry? Mm -hmm. That was our days. That, that That's what happened. But nowadays, the modern parents what i find is that the children they don't allow the children to hurt and and to cry and so children grow up being weak they grow up being weak and they are not street smart mm -hmm. and they are not they don't understand life they try to protect them they keep protecting their children i i know of a family who they have this this this, this little boy and they they did everything for the little boy everything and sadly the mother passed and this boy moved into one of the relative home. And they're not going to treat him like that. 
And so he suffered a lot of pain until he learned how to, to grow up. And so when we take things from persons, when we take things from our children, it is not to kill them, it is to help them. And so the science of it must be taught that I am trying to rescue you from something called addiction. I don't want you to become addicted to this thing, so I'm trying to help you. Teach them the science of it. If they are older but younger, take it from them. Let them cry. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Sister Sandra. Pastor, so um, the stigma does this also lead lead over into relationships? Yes. Where it's um abusive. Yes. So you're taking me into the other lessons. Okay. So fine. you follow me, right? Because definitely that's where we're going. Because when when you remember that I said that addiction is. In the Latin word, addictus, which means that you have become a slave to this. When you're a slave to something, you don't know what you have done. I've I've seen situation where men got drunk and beat their wives, and in the morning when they become sober, they wonder, they ask, "What is wrong with you? Why why are you looking like that?" And so a lot of these things are happening, and relationships are suffering. And though we have kept silent in the church about this, I'm going to be speaking about some church stuff and let us understand what is happening in the church. All right? So we're going to, we're going to go into it. Thanks for the questions. I appreciate them. All right? So let's get a little deeper into this now. Yes, go ahead, Sister Faye. Yes, Pastor Bill Keith. Yes, I'm listening to the discussion about the using of these things within the service you know mm -hmm. and the parents are really right they're sitting it's with like with the small ones and even with the teenagers or say the adolescents so because i sat one sabbath with two they could be like 18 or that age you know and they were home the thing straight and the parent was just there to beside me you know but it's distracting for me so i said hello could you mm -hmm. just put away your church, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they put it away. And at the end of the service, I said, thank you for listening and putting it away. And the yeah. parent is right there. Or yeah. sometimes it is smaller ones too. And the parents are right there, as I say, playing, playing straight. And sometimes a little sound you can hear and you can see what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And you talk and normally say something, I'm telling you. Or if it's too much now, then I take another seat. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. I so these are things that really happening in churches straight yeah. through. Something yeah. need to really right. for solve it, make an announcement, talk right. with them about yeah, to put away. But it's too much now. Yeah. So what we're doing is that the dopamine in this little child's head is rushing towards pleasure. And so we're going to see that once the dopamine rush towards pleasure. This child will have nothing to do with pain. That is why our children can't read the Bible. If you give them a book Bible, they don't know where to find John and Matthew and, and all of these books. Give a teenager, the typical teenager, one of the Bible that we use with, with pages and leaves and tell them to find a particular passage in it and they can't find it. Because what we have done is that we have trained their minds to electronics and their minds have become the brain have become so lazy because of dopamine that now flooded the one side that is called pleasure and because the pleasure side is flooded the pain side is there crying out and wondering why am i being ignored and so then simply what is going to happen later on is that because the pleasure side is flooded, you have reached your maximum limit and you really can't go any further. Then you're going to look for something higher to take you higher and higher. So that let, let's get into that one now and show you a little bit more about that, how that work. All right, so how it works. This is how it works. So most drug of abuse our drug substance of abuse should, or as I mentioned before, including cigarettes. This is what cigarette does. It increases the concentration of dopamine. In other words, 
they keep using cigarette because it is not because it is not an illegal drug. So drugs that are not illegal can be called gateway drugs. And gateway drugs, all it does is that it opens up a way for you to use a, a higher and a stronger drug. So most drugs abuse, drug of abuse, including cigarettes, increases the concentration of dopamine. In other words, persons feel tired, they smoke a cigarette. They feel they just wake up, they smoke a cigarette. So what they're doing is that they're feeding on the dopamine. And think of dopamine as, as a reservoir or, or, or a drug, a jug of water, and you're pulling from it. You throw a glass of water out of it every time and you keep throwing a glass of water out of dopamine. Then simply what it is going to do is that you, you're not going to have so much fun anymore. And it is going to wonder why not? And so it is going to search for an avenue to have more fun. And that's what it is. So most drug of abuse, including cigarette, increases the concentration of dopamine in the nucleus accumbens and the mesolimbic system. These are big words, but all I mean is that these are the reward system in the brain. So the reward system in the brain, if you do something good, you're going to be rewarded. You get a star. When you're at the, the, the what they call them, the, the kindergarten um, centers, you you do something good and and um you get a star. And people people reward you for these things. So what this does is that every time you smoke a cigarette, the dopamine reward you for that. So you smoke one and it is not enough. The dopamine said that, hey, I want more, smoke some more. And then when the dopamine is tired of cigarettes, then it moves to something else because the nucleus accumbens and the mesolimbic system, which is the brain's reward system, is tired of giving out reward for that one drug. It's just tired. So over um, stimulation exhausts the dopamine. It's like it pulls too much from it and causes the brain to reduce both the amount of dopamine available and the receptor sites, which is which is which which they bind. So if you keep pulling from one source, then we run the risk of losing the amount there or the potency of it, the strength of it, because we keep pulling from it over and over. So this is how it works in to the common man. Let me tell you how it works. So most users start out seeking the high and the high is what we talk about in terms of how people feel when they use a particular drug that comes from the, the, the drug use. Later, they use drugs to avoid withdrawal. I explained withdrawal earlier. Withdrawal means, therefore, that they're going to suffer pain if they pull that away from them. In withdrawal, they experience what is called a dysphoria. And this is a mental state that describes a feeling of distress, discomfort, or unease. They really don't like it. They don't like this because I want the drug. And so if they don't get it, they're going to have to do something. That is why persons on the street who are addicted will go at length. They will rob their mothers. So their mother will have their money to go to the doctor. It is for their medication to keep them alive. And they will go in and they know that and they will rob their mothers for drugs. They will rob their children and take their children's school money for drugs because they need a higher fix. So when we talk about dependence or, or um, addiction, we're not talking about something that you can walk away from. Like you go somewhere and somebody said, do you want a drink? I said, no, I'm okay. I'm good. No. I'm talking about a young man who told me recently when he was traveling to, to the addiction center to be treated. And when he was coming through the airport, his gate was beside a bar. And he tried, he said, he did everything in his power not to take a drink. And, and, and he said he ran away from that section, from that gate, 
and he had to come right back and he went and he drank right there. And he didn't just drink one, you know. He drank more than one. And so addiction, when we're talking about, is this kind of a feeling that we can pull ourselves away from it. Why do you think that some people rather pleasure? So in other words, you are having meeting at church, Pastor Quarry, and there are people who cannot pull themselves away from whatever pleasure to come to church. And they will give any kind of excuse and tell all kind of lies why they can't come to church because they have this kind of a pre-addiction. And if it worked upon, then they are going to become addicted to whatever they are doing, whatever lifestyle. It could be just simply at home on a smartphone or watching TV. And so these little things will drive us into addictive behaviors. And so we're going to see some more about it. Let's talk about some substance now. Some of the substance that we become addicted to, alcohol, caffeine, that a number of persons keep drinking and they can't do without it normally. When you have withdrawal from caffeine, you're going to have headache. That is one of the first things that you're going to have. Why? Because once the dopamine um, is trying to find that substance and can't find it, what it does is that it is like a noisy child trying to bang around, I want caffeine, I want caffeine. So that pain section in your brain, which is, which, which is now screaming out, and so caffeine lack of it is going to give you that. We have cannabis, marijuana, we have hallucinogens, LSD, and these alters perception. Now, I want to tell you a story here because what happened to me once is that somebody gave me something um, and somebody that I trust, mind you, I thought I trust, and they gave me something and marijuana was in it. And I started hallucinate and I saw people running after me. So this drug is not a simple drug. You will literally see things happening because your brain is telling you that this is happening. And so hallucinogens, LSDs, all of these have this kind of um, receptions. Um, the hypno hypnotics, sedative drugs, and these are drugs sometimes that they will give to kids who... Um, suffer from ADHD and I'm going to talk about that if you have a child because I had a, I have a child who was diagnosed with ADHD and they wanted to medicate him and my wife and myself said you know it's not going to work um in aliens thinner aerosol spray gases there are people who love to go to the gas station and smell the gas and people love to smell it. And some people can't stand it, but people love to smell gas. What that does is that there's a receptor that likes that and dopamine is released. Anytime you have pleasure with something, dopamine is released. If dopamine does not release, it means that you're not enjoying whatever you're enjoying. So once you smell that, dopamine is released. So you want to smell it some more. I want to smell it some more, right? Um, prescription and non-prescription opioids such as, um, wait a minute, such as codeine, oxycodone, and heroin. And these are used for pain. So people are suffering severe pain. What they do is that they have opo um, opioid and heroin in the, some of these prescription drugs. Prescription and non-prescription stimulants now, such as Adderall. Adderall is the one that is mainly used for ADHD, children suffering from ADHD. Now, and also methamphetamine. These are treated, treats um, obesity and ADHD. These, all of these that I mentioned are addictive. Every single one of them and more. Now, I let me pause here to say that when you go to your doctor, and I'm not telling anybody to stop taking your medication tonight. That's not what I'm doing. What I'm saying, when you go to your doctor, try to find out what is being prescribed to you and look at the dosage that is being prescribed to you 
and how you should take them. That is why if the doctor said, take two tablets once per day, don't take three. Don't increase the dosage. And if they said, take it um, every three hours, try to stick to that. Take it every three hours. These guys have the science and they understand how this thing works on the brain. Because if you take it at a particular time, it is going to affect the dopamine in terms of how it operates in the body. And also Adderall, what Adderall does to the child, it, 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 it increases the stimulus. So there's stimulants in the brain, in the child. And so for children who are running around the place and doing all kinds of stuff, they give them this, it is going to keep them calm for a moment, but then it may become addictive because they're going to like it. A nurse was telling me recently that what she found out happening is that people are coming into the hospital and saying that they're having pain. Now, what they really want is opioid because of the medication. And so when the doctor increased the dosage, it is going to increase the amount of drug that the opioid brings. And so now that is how they're getting the drug because some of them can purchase it on the street and so they have to have their drugs. Tobacco, nicotine, cigarettes, and electronic cigarette vaping also carry that strong substance addictive. So persons will all have, have to do it. Try your best not to let people smoke around you because it also affects the receptors in your brain. And it is something that you can get used to, although it may not smell good at first. So try not to let people smoke around you. It is not just an immoral act that you don't like. It is not healthy for you. And secondhand smoke also produces some kind of cancerous activities. So we need to be careful. Non-substance addictions are gambling, eating, exercising or dieting, shopping, shoplifting or other risky behaviors, having sex, viewing pornography, video gaming, internet gaming disorders. These are called non-substance addictions, which means therefore you're not actually taking a substance, but you're actually involving in a, in a behavior. And these behaviors will now lead you towards what we call um, non-substance addiction. So persons are addicted to, 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 to gambling. And for the lay persons, you will never understand addiction until you speak with somebody who is addicted. You'll never understand it. I never did before until I had a conversation with somebody and I asked them, and some and this person told me, he said that I would lose an arm to get a drink. I would have somebody cut off one of my arm to get a drink. He said, that is how badly I need it. This is not something that he wants to do. So this is past psychological substance right now. This past that stage and then it moves into the realm where this person is now truly addicted to this drug. It's like they have become one and not getting this means therefore that they are going to have some problems. And that is why the lessons coming up are going to show you um, some of the things that they do when we talk about detoxing and all of these things, it's not easy, all right? So, but look at this. Um, so also using the internet and the smartphones and all of that. So what I've done is to look at some of the common addictive behaviors among Christians, believe it or not. And these are some of them. The internet use, which is a pathological um, use. This is not just use it for studying or whatever. It's a pathological use where you, people are talking to you and you're not even listening. You're driving and you're on your phone it's a use involving social media, phone, and others. That's one of them that Christians are involved in. Christians are also involved in food addiction, overeating. 
And a number of persons don't recognize this until when they realize that they start to get obese. Um, shop shopping online. I I visited, you know, I remember in my other world, I visited a home because of work. And when I went into this one bedroom apartment, there was no place for me to move. There were boxes and boxes, unopened boxes that the person was purchasing. And she had nowhere to put them. Boxes were on her bed and all over the room. And she just purchased things online. Um, that's an addiction. Workaholic, and most of our pastors are guilty of this. They work very, very hard, especially in the ministry. Some of them out of guilt. Some of them really love the ministry and love the Lord and want to, 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 to see the better. There are other people, especially, and coming to this country, I recognize that work here is more serious than in Jamaica. I'm telling you the truth. It's very hard. It's very difficult to survive here. And so persons working three jobs and four jobs sometimes trying to get by. And so persons not careful, they run themselves into problems. Sex is another one, masturbation, especially among um, unmarried people who find themselves in, in a lonely um, situation. And loneliness and boredom are recipe for all of these. Once persons feel bored, once they feel like, you know, there's nothing more for me to do right now. I have nobody to call. Nobody is calling me. I'm by myself. Then they are going to start to engage in these kind of lifestyles. And it's very sad to say sometimes that even leaders sometimes find themselves in some of these um, positions. Sometimes when relationships get bad between husband and wife, all of some of these behaviors will, will pop up um, because relationship is not happening. Intimate relationship is not happening among husbands and wives. And so we find that um, the sexual activity will increase to the pleasure side. And so the dopamine will now start to increase on that side. And so persons will start to, so persons will go on computers and they will start to look at porn in a soft porn, they call it. And they look at maybe persons not dressed properly and then they increase it and it keeps increasing and increasing. And before you know it, they have a history behind them of, of, of porn watching. And so a lot of these um, activities happen among them. So, what we have done is that we have looked at defining addiction, looking at what addiction is and how it actually works with the dopamine on the brain and how it actually feeds into what we do. So whatever behavior we are involving in that is detrimental to our health, to our health and to other persons, and we still continue to do that, that can lead to an addictive behavior. And so it is something that we have to be careful. Pastor Moore, I'm, I'm unable to raise my hand because... I'm Go ahead, sir. Go ahead. But um, there's a question I want to ask. As you talk about the sex, can it be that um, there's a saying that, you know, I love it. I love it bad. Can it be that one partner is addicted and so the other one cannot keep up with he or she? Definitely, because because one other thing that we that, that that I want to say to us, you know, is that I'm and I'm going to stick to the science of it because the science of it I think explain it better than I can. Because one other thing that I want us to understand, I see your hand, Pastor Lynn. Um, one other thing that I want us to understand is whatever you feeds is going to grow. Whatever you feed is going to grow. So if you have, again, if you, if you have two children and you're going to treat one better than the other, it's like a Cinderella story, then what we're going to find is that one is going to appear to be better than the other. And so if we feed into these kind of a sexual act, and as Pastor Quarry asked earlier, most of the time when persons are like that, there have been some kind of abuse. 
that has taken place with that individual. Most of the time, and I'm not saying all, but most time when you find that persons are saying that they are, they love sex and they, they want sex and they love sex more than their partner. And abuse don't necessarily mean that they have been physically touched either, you know, because sexual abuse don't necessarily mean that they have been physically touched. It means that they have been exposed to sexual material. And so most of the time that you see people are like that, they have been in an area where they have been exposed. And so the dopamine increase the pleasure. And so they want more of it. There are people who get married because of sex. And when they realize that it is really not working out, the marriage is going to break up because, you know, it's not, it's not what I expected. So they move on to somebody else who can supply what they really need. So yes, Pastor, I agree with that. Pastor Leng, go ahead, please. Open your mic. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Yes, sir. I, as you were talking, I want to do, I noticed that you're going from, from the physiological, the neurological, and the chemical. But I am looking at all of these that you see here. If I were to group them up, then could we say, I know it may not be defined according to the, the psychologists and the psychiatrists, whatever we do. But I think sin, sin fits into, uh, are all of these that we have here, they command the sin because we know that one addiction can lead to another. But isn't it a fact that generally speaking, we have an addiction to sin? And, and that is as why, human being. That is why I started out with, with the passage that I read from um from from Ephesians chapter five. I started out there because and I did say earlier that we we practice a certain kind of lifestyle, then what is going to happen? It is got it's going to it's going to fuel a fire, if you may. To a behavior. So, so here it is, you know, that we as human beings, we we carry with us a certain kind of a, a, a structured life, if you may. So my life is structured in a particular way. And if I don't cross my T's and dot my I's, then I'm going to do what the other person is doing. If I don't structure my life. If I leave my life careless and I really don't watch and see what I am doing, then I'm going to become like them. There goes I, but for the grace of God. Because I have brothers, I have relatives who, who are on substance, addiction. And so, and I am not. You follow me? And it is not because I am better and I'm good. But it is because I structure my life in a particular way. And I keep telling myself that I rather bear the pain than the pleasure. Because I, I remember that I mentioned, you know, I'm past the lane, that some of us are running away from the pain. Now, here's the pain. The pain is people are saying to you, let's go to this party. And you can't go. You feel sad. You're alone. You're bored. You're by yourself. You can't go because you're a Christian. They go to this party and they have tons of fun. They drink, they smoke, they dance, involving sexual activities, and that's their pleasure. But you are now, and you use your pain to morph yourself into a kind of a character that is different. So you have to use your pain to, to knead yourself like a dough into the thing that you want. So is it sin? Of course. Of course it is It is. It is wrapped up in sin because that's what it is. And most of these pleasures are sinful. And so if we're not careful, 
we go, we're going to lose ourselves to that kind of a lifestyle if we're not willing to deal with the pain and we run away because we want the pleasure. So yes, sin has a hand in it. But what I didn't want us to do is to see addiction as this demonic, hence the introduction earlier, just to see it as demonic and wrong and sinful. There's a science behind it. And the science is what God made us with, something called the pleasure center, the dopamine that was to use to feel his own pleasure and his own glory. Imagine when you're in a church service and the preacher is preaching or some songs are singing and you feel the presence of the Lord inside of you. And, and you really don't want it to stop. You're experiencing a level of dopamine there you know, that the Lord create. But sometimes we use this for the wrong thing. And when we do that, we are involving in sinful acts. So yes, that's where it is. <laughs> Anybody Thank else? You. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, sir. Wonderful. wonderful. I love it, Pastor. <laughs> Anyone else? Let's go to it. I remember the passage that was read because we don't want to leave it up. We're going to come back to it next week, mind you, because we want to dig into that passage a little bit and to let people understand that, hey, the, 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 the pleasure that you're now feeling is that you're feeding. It's like you're using dopamine and feeding that pleasure. And the more you feed it, it is more it's going to want more. It's more it's going to want. So if you think that just getting a little sip of alcohol or whatever you do now, um, you can stop, you're making a sad mistake. That's not how it works. That's not how the brain works. That's not what it was designed to do. It was designed in a way in that whatever you feed into it, that's what it is going to absorb and it is going to take. So that is why we keep saying to you, read the word of God. Pray fast. We keep saying these things because these are pain side that we're trying to increase. We're trying to increase the pain side of life where it is so hard to pray, so hard to fast. But when you do that, you decrease the pleasure side, which the dopamine is going to add more to. So that's what we're doing. Any questions? <laughs> so, all right, there is man, but so it it is safe to say then that that God has given us His Holy Spirit to empower us that we can break our addiction to sin. <laughs> and those and those are exactly Sorry, repeat that, yourself, sir. Simple. Repeat yourself. Repeat yourself. No, I said the fact that we have this addiction to to sin. Yes. Is is it that's why God has given us His Holy Spirit to give us power to break this addiction? That's right. Because because one of the things I I know I know you got it okay, but one of the things I find is that we we don't seem to recognize that a lot of time people are giving the devil a lot of credit. But I I may, you might go into this later on, but but drug pushers. Mm -hmm. Our drug lords, mm -hmm. they use people's addictions. So they try to get you addicted first. Of course. And then they use your addiction to manipulate you into behavior that you have no control over. So it is the same way that Satan, and I, and I noticed that you talk about enslavement earlier on. Right. So it is not Satan that really has power to make us do things. What he does. He uses our addiction to these behaviors yeah. to manipulate us. That's right. Right. And so without the Spirit of God, he is going to have us as slaves. Yes. But by the grace of God, we have the ability to actually overcome them. And I think, although we are looking at it from a wide perspective, the believer in Christ must understand that we have to look at sin from a particular perspective because the the addiction, the addiction behaviors and so on that you're highlighting, they're actually outgrowths 
of sin. Mm -hmm. it, is our, it is our quest for pleasure mm -hmm. that leads us to certain behavior. Mm -hmm. But thank God, God does not want to deprive us of pleasure, but he wants us to have good pleasure. It is right. And but for that to happen, we ha he, he has to get us out of this behavior mm -hmm. that is going to lead to our destruction mm -hmm. instead of our eternal well-being. I see. All right. I okay. That. That's very good. One other thing, as you spoke earlier, Pastor Leng, about Satan using whatever means, when you go to the movies, you have something called popcorn. And the popcorn, they increase the salt in the popcorn. And not only that, but they have sodas that are very sweet. Now, dopamine feeds on these kind of elements, salt and sweet. Hence, you have certain manufacturers that cook chicken, for example, and people gravitate towards it because of, of the taste and the MSGs in all of these food. And so what you find is that the kind of food that we eat is that what it does is that it increases dopamine and the pleasure side of it. So food is another thing which I'll also talk about as it relates to us addicted to certain food. That is why um, many people are developing lifestyle diseases because of the food and they can't stop although they know that this thing will cause problem later on they still eat it because of the pleasure and they're feeding the pleasure side of it and it is a form of early addiction and we want to get into that too go ahead um sister lorraine good evening everyone thank you pastor Valkis. Um, I want to add, I, I agree with all of what you said, and I'm really enjoying the discussion. I also want to add that not only do people start using drugs because of pleasure, some people self-medicate and they use it because of pain to numb, numb themselves and to medicate themselves. So we also have to mention that and uh, stress positive coping methods. That is right. I appreciate that. Thank you for saying that. All right. So, but I want us to remind us what we did tonight was to look at addiction defined. So we're now defining addiction tonight. So for the couple of weeks in which we'll be going, we're going to go into um, how the reaction now, what causes this, what how people operate within this, and and so on. Um, you know, a lot of stuff. We're going to talk about a lot of stuff going forward. Go ahead, Sister Sandra. Yes, there is a question uh, in the chat. Oh, I didn't. Let me go to it. Uh, From uh, Missionary Smith. Uh, man, let me see if I can. Okay. What advice do you have for unmarried sisters who from day to day experience natural sexual feelings? Um. I would like her to describe natural sexual feelings for me because if they're having natural sexual feelings, then that's okay. If they're having natural sexual feelings, then that's fine. That's okay. Nothing is wrong with natural sexual feelings. But if they're having unnatural sexual feelings, then that's where the issue is. And the advice that I would have for them is not to keep it a secret. You have to talk to somebody about it. The devil thrive in secrets. That's where the devil lives. And the devil will tell you, don't say anything about it. Don't talk about it. Because people are going to embarrass you, you're going to be ashamed and all of that. But what the devil didn't tell you is that the longer you stay in it and the longer you keep doing it is the worse you're getting. So if, if a sister, an unmarried sister, is having problem sexually, I would say to that sister, talk to somebody about it. Don't keep it a secret. 
because what you're going to do is that, and I'm not going to be getting too graphic with this because what we find is that the more you get into the act is the more you're going to want to do more things. And, and that's basic what I'm saying, because I'm assuming kids are on and I really don't want to get into it. But, you know, one of the one of the author that I read about and she also was addicted. She was addicted to. To, to um, romance books. Because there are a lot of people think that addiction is just um, substance. She was addicted to romance books. And she was talking about this gentleman that she was treating because she's a, she's a she's a therapist, and she was talking about this gentleman that was that she was treating, that he passed the stage of masturbation and he made a machine for it. He actually created a machine because he couldn't help himself anymore, and so people who are in that. Um, that kind of a state need to speak to somebody and speak to somebody immediately because what you're doing is that you're increasing the need for it. And once you increase the need for it is the darker you're going to get in a room. So you're, you're moving into more secret to do it and you're coming up with, with more devices and more ways of making this thing work. And so once you do that, then you're now slipping away from the crowd and you're by yourself and you you by yourself, you're going to do whatever you want to do. And it's getting worse. And normally people who are involved in these sexual acts, um, there are other disorders that are developed as a result of these. Sometimes um, suicide ideation, they become... Um, you know, all kind of disorders. A lot of disorders are coming from these. And I don't want to get into the disorders right now, but I'm saying if you have a sexual problem, deal with it because that is one of the most serious disorder that you can, um, addiction that you can ever have. Talk to somebody about it. But I see the question and it says natural sexual feelings. If it is natural, everything is fine. Everything is good. If it is unnatural, then that's where the problem is. But I think she meant unnatural. But thank you for your question. Um, is that Missionary Smith? Thank you very much. Anybody else? Any other questions? Pastor, can I may I say something? Um Please, to yeah. the natural sexual feelings that yes. this that Missionary Smith talked about every day. So I want to I know women and men are different. I want to mention that the average woman has a sexual peak somewhere between 37 and 45. Yes. And if that person is single yes. and does yes. not have an outlet, yes. what that yes. person can do, and, and I know people, some people are going to say, oh, prayer is not the answer for everything, is begin to talk to God about it. Mm -hmm. Explain to God where you are, what you feel, what you're thinking, what you even want. Mm -hmm. And you, believe it or not, uh, maybe it's not even just sex that the body is craving. It could just be intimacy. And here's an opportunity to grow in intimacy with your Lord. And, and, and even say, you know, to God, if you want a spouse, ask for the spouse and continue to remind them because God clearly understands even the natural sexual urges. And that's what I would say. Definitely. I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, prayer, prayer always. A lot of people talk about, and I agree with you, a lot of people think that you praying about these things it doesn't make sense. It makes a lot of sense, believe me. I mean, you pray about it because, and and don't go to God and pray and tell God to take away the feeling. Don't do that. Stop doing that if you're doing it because he will take it away. And then later on, when you get married now, you'll have no sexual feeling for your husband. And then that's where the problem comes in. You need to ask God to help you, show you how to deal with the issues, how to manage it because it is it is... But and so sex is one of the the strongest ad addiction as it relates to anybody else. I mean, I don't know if you can measure any of them, but when it comes to sex, it is it is really hard to deal with, and especially for those who are single. 
for those who are single, it must be very, very difficult. All right. And so I'm saying talk to somebody about it that you can talk to. That is one of the best advice I can give you. Because if you stay by yourself, you're going to do it and you're going to keep doing it and do it and do it and doing until you can't help yourself anymore. Then you go to somebody else to do it with. So you need to speak to somebody about it and somebody that you can trust and someone that can help you out of the situation. Don't talk to anybody who's going to show you how to do it because you have some people who will do that. Lay down from bed and start to talk to you in a sexy voice and that kind of thing. That can't help you. That is going to make the matter worse. So speak to somebody who is going to help you and show you the right way how to deal with the matter. That is what this will do. All right. I think I've come to the end of my presentation, Pastor Quarry. And um, this is it for, for this uh, evening. I hope that you all enjoyed this presentation. And if you did, I'm going to ask you to come back next week because we're going to pick it up a little bit more when we talk about how this thing actually works, the impact of it on families and all of those things. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pastor Moore. God bless you, sir. Very, 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 very interesting. Um, some I learn a lot, really. I learn a lot as to, you know, those three areas of the brain and how they work and how they function and, and how you feed them. I, I think I, I have my takeaway for my son, especially my son, Zachary. Um, Thank you so much. It's powerful, a, a lot of information, very relevant and, and important for us as, as, as an individual, as us as people, as us Christian. One other thing I always say, although we are Christian, we are still normal people of society. And so we have to be mindful of that. And I like the holistic um, you know, view that we have on this platform so that we are not just focusing on the spiritual side of our lives and end up being no earthly good. So God bless you. I'm excited for the rest of the week. Uh, real stuff. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to God. Be the glory. Um, we, will, we will hear more coming forward um, from you on this topic. I'm, I'm excited. I can't wait. I wish we have six weeks in August, but nevertheless. All right, so we're going to invite um, Pastor Leng to just close us off in prayer um, tonight. And um, Pastor Marshall, you know, give the honor as usual over the past years, blessing us. We are grateful for his consistency to this ministry as well. And then Sister Quarry will come with the vote of thanks and um, some announcement. Thank you. Let us pray. Our God and our Father, we give you thanks for your goodness to us. We thank you for your love. We thank you, Lord, that you made us father for your glory and great god no matter what challenges we may be facing father you have not abandoned your plan for us father to have us conform to the image of your son jesus christ we thank you great god that you have provided avenues through which we can be educated lord and re-educated so that our lives our conduct on a daily basis, Lord, our thinking will be aligned with your divine purpose for all of us. We thank you for giving us leaders, great God, giving us, Father, your chosen instruments to help us to accomplish your purpose for us. 
And I really thank you for Pastor Moore, great God, and for allowing him, Lord, to provide us, great God, with different viewpoints, Father God, different perspectives about addiction, Father, that we can face challenges, Lord, with confidence, with courage, and to be able to help someone along the way, Father, in their struggles. We know, Lord, that you, Father, are the source of all true wisdom. And Father, once we rely on you, great God, you will supply all our needs according to your riches in glory through Jesus Christ. Amen. We thank you for everyone who has been privileged, Father, to benefit from this presentation tonight. And we pray, Lord, that you will help us, that we will not just be willing hearers, Father, but we will seek, Lord, to put that which we have heard into practice, great God, so that it will bring transformation to our own minds and actions and will be more beneficial, great God, to those in our spheres of influence. We thank you again for this platform that you continue to use, Lord, to bless your people near and far. Thank you for the leadership, the teams that work, great God, so that there is harmony, Father God, and that there is quality in the presentation. We know, Lord, it is not mere human wisdom, Father, or skill. It is, Father, the enabling power of your spirit that is at work, great God, because you want us all to mature, Father, attaining unto the image and statue of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for one more opportunity. Thank you for all those who month after month continue, Lord, to avail themselves, great God, that they can be used to be a blessing to others. We know, Lord, that you truly love us with an everlasting love. You allow us, Lord, to get instruction, Father, that in other forum, great God, it would cause us great price. But, Father, you did say, Lord, that if we are thirsty, we should come to you. Amen. If we are hungry, we should come to you, great God, because you have an eternal supply. Thank you again, Lord, for your many blessings and your divine favor. And may you help us to continue to grow in grace and in the knowledge of you and Jesus Christ more and more every day, living in conformity to your will and being the light and all that you have called us to be so that glory will come to you as you work out your purpose in our lives. We thank you again for this forum and we say thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Pastor Link. Pastor Marshall, we invite you at this time. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Are you hear me? Sure, sir. To God be the glory. And now unto him that is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Father, majestic and poor, both now and forevermore. Let the saints of the living God shout, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Praise the praise Lord. Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Thank you, Pastor Marshall. Sister Corey, we invite you at this time. Bless the Lord. Bless Amen. the Lord. It is indeed my pleasure can to you stop say. The recording, please, for me. I can. Mm -hmm.